everyone. How's everybody doing? Oh, this is much more crowded than it was earlier. <laughs> so we are super excited to be here on the main stage to talk about uh, food tech funding and food tech investment and what that space looks like today and what it might look like in the future. Um, so I'm going to actually let my panelists do quick introductions. Uh, my name is Ashley Dano. I have been uh, working with Mike since the beginning of Smart Kitchen Summit. And it's the first year he's trusted me to be on the main stage, so I'm really excited. It's a little bit of a promotion. Um, but I'll let you guys do some quick intros, and then we'll dive in. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Frank. I'm uh, from FTW Ventures, where I'm the general partner, and we invest and advise in early stage food and agricultural technology companies that are up and coming to radically transform our food system. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carmen Palafox, and I'm a venture capitalist with Mila Capital Advisors. We invest primarily in companies that go through our four month accelerator program, and we have deep expertise in manufacturing and product development. Um, we focus on the hardware tech space, which includes uh, Industry 4.0, uh, advanced manufacturing, and food and ag. And good morning, Tom Mastroboni, CFO for Tyson Ventures. Uh, we invest in emerging technologies that affect all aspects of the food supply chain. Excellent. Okay. So I want to dive right in, and I have a couple questions for sort of each of you based on your backgrounds. But Brian, you've been investing for a couple of years now. Um, we've been talking, obviously, about this space. It's, it's radically transformed since even SKS started a few, four years ago. Um, what's, what's radically different now in what investors and, and VCs are excited about versus, you know, two, three years ago? And, and why, why has there been such a shift? Yeah, I think uh, the big shift has happened because uh, we're all starting to wake up that our food system is a massive, massive industry um, that is undergoing some radical changes uh, due to things like climate change, access to labor, uh, health care, a $24 trillion industry where we have curable diseases like diabetes and heart conditions that are linked to food and diet. And so um, as investors, we always look for what's the next big thing. And I think a lot of people from Silicon Valley where I operate are starting to see that the food industry is the next big thing uh, to get involved in. Uh, the great thing is we're seeing that from all sides, uh, and, and Tom can talk about how, cor how corporate is also now playing a role in that. Um, but it's just it's, it's great for the world to see all this money going to what is one of the most human essential industries in the world. Yeah. Um, Tom, how, how does Tyson look at, so you're a large company and you've got this VC arm, you know, how do you look at what investments make sense for you all and, and you know, how is that different from someone like Carmen who's in hardware or sort of looking at, um, you know, different, uh, different types of spaces? Yeah, I mean, what's great for us is, and, and it's also sort of the bane of my existence, is we have such a large supply chain, right? It's so complicated. We deal with everything from corn and soy on the chicken feed side all the way up to putting finished product into a Chick-fil-A or a McDonald's and, and the tray pack poultry that you folks hopefully buy a lot of in the grocery store, yeah? Um, so we, we, look at, we look at technologies from sort of two angles. We say, how applicable is this going to be to our supply chain? Or how disruptive is this going to be to our supply chain going forward? And then, Carmen, you, you all look at sort of from the hardware lens, but you also have the accelerator mixed in. And when we talked, I asked you, you know, what, how do you decide what's worth investing in? What companies are ready for that investment? Um, and I thought it was interesting that you sort of looked at, uh, the accelerator was a key part of that because you felt like you really wanted to dig in and see if the business model made sense. Absolutely. And uh, just, you know, another aspect of investing for us is timing. So a lot has to do with cultural shifts and the way people are thinking about food safety. So for example, we just invested in a company called PathSpot and they're detecting pathogens um, in, in big food chains. Um, and so testing for whether or not employees have washed their hands properly. Uh, in the US, a majority of people don't wash their hands long enough. So this is more of a cultural shift where, you know, we used to just brush our teeth with a manual toothbrush, and now we have the toothbrush that tells you when you have uh, brush your teeth for two minutes. PathSpot is, is trying to change culture within um, food chains to say, okay, you're not washing your hands fast enough. So a lot of this does come from the entrepreneur that is seeing different changes and wants to address certain problems. So the cultural piece is interesting because we, in our discussion before, we sort of talked about, um, you know, the things in food tech that, 
either flopped or didn't take off the way people thought. And a couple of those were meal kits. Um, certainly food delivery was sort of getting large investments. And part of our discussion was around, you know, a lot of that is changing consumer behavior. And what we're realizing is that consumer behavior, you know, that meal kits don't really fit into a lot of the way that people like to cook. And so, Brian, from your, curious from your perspective, you know, what can we learn from that? And how are we getting better at figuring out, you know, what consumers are really going to adapt or what businesses really need from the space? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because I think when we got into the meal kit um, and now the delivery businesses, um, everybody's like, oh, well, this is going to crush the market and everybody's going to be doing it this one way. Um, but I like to call the way that we eat is multimodal, meaning we eat different ways at different times and, and different parts of our life. So we have to think about all of those different user experiences that we have to solve for. And I think meal kits solved one specific problem, but di they weren't the transformative way that everybody was going to cook. Delivery is the same thing. I think more and more people are saying, well, I'll just get something delivered because it's so easy. But I still see people sitting at home cooking a Sunday meal for their family because it's a, it's a, it's a cultural and relational thing as well. So we as investors need to look at the whole cycle of what the consumer cares about, not just one aspect of it. That being said, I mean, when you look at the delivery market and you look at like uh, Domino's Pizza, which has been one of the uh, fastest rising stocks on the stock market for, for 20 years, um, you realize there's very big business to be made there. And that's why you see uh, startups like, if any of you know, Zoom Pizza, you know, that raise a ridiculous amount of money from SoftBank because they're like, well, we're going to transform that whole industry that you'll figure out where people want food, cook it on the go, and then you'll get it there in even less time than a Domino's truck could show up. And so I think everybody's thinking about, okay, let's build up these big industries, but let's also look at the user journey around food. Um, and I just gotta get one thing off my chest here. Uh, um, so uh, I gotta get this off my chest. I've been, I've been suffering with this all morning. Uh, I stole something from an Amazon Go store. Um, so, uh, Apparently, Amazon spends millions and millions of dollars to develop a uh, system that can track you in their store, yet they don't track the bags. So I literally walked out with a dollar bag and didn't get charged for and stuff like that. So this is where I think like technology as a service uh, for these things is still is still evolving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we won't tell. I mean, you can tweet that if anyone got a picture and you want to report him. Yeah, I think there report are some Amazon the, people the here actually. Authorities so here he'll pursuing be backstage that. later if you want to. Nab him. Um, but that actually does speak to a point. So Amazon Go, you know, is certainly a way that the grocery experience is, is transforming. This a idea of personalization is really get, becoming embedded sort of in every part of the system, I think. Um, Carmen, one of the things I thought was interesting about you all is that you look at things like biotech and other areas and really looking at sort of, you know, how are are the human genome and genetics going to transform what we eat? And, and there was there's folks last year that talked about that too. That stuff is fascinating because the implications there for how that could transform the way we eat seem huge. Yeah, we do. You know, uh, we have a big innovation lab in LA. It has a, a makerspace, um, a biotech lab co-working. So we really are fostering innovation. And we made our first investment into an epigenetics company. Um, called Prosper DNA. So they're taking into account what your environment is like and applying that to personalization of what you should be eating. So that's a very interesting um, kind of shift in how people are thinking about food um, based on either their blood type or their environment or um, their microbiome. Um, I'm going to pause right here and say that we will take a few audience questions. So if you wanted to go on Slido and put some up, we will, uh, towards the end, take some. So if something is coming up that you're like, oh, that's good, it makes me think of something, make sure you plug it into your browser so you don't forget. Um, Tom, what what is the, you, you all invested in Tavala, and that was uh, sort of a, a little bit of a shift because uh, a lot of your investments were on alternative proteins and, you know, looking at gaps in the Tyson um, offerings. So you talk a little bit about that. That's interesting because they're a hardware, but they're also a subscription and, and food system, right? So it's kind of a combo. And, and what was the you know, decision there? And what did you see in Tavala that really sort of struck a chord? Uh, I, I think we saw, um, you know, to, to Brian's point about shifting, where are consumers going um, and, and about convenience, right? People eat now, I think it's 5.9 times a day, not three. Um, I don't know who the where the point one is. I'd have I, it, it bothers me. Um, but it, it, when you look at and we talked about meal kits and we're like, well, it's going to cut down on food waste. It actually hasn't. It's going to make things more convenient. It's not. 
Um, so how can we leverage technology to make this actually work in a way that makes sense? So we saw the Tovala investment. David and his team are fantastic. Uh, we, we're looking at ways to partner with them. That's part of our ethos is we're not just going to put money into a deal because we think it's interesting or we think it's going to do something for us down the road. Um, we look at it as how can this fit into our consumer business, right? People think about Tyson, oh, the poultry the store, but we have our Jimmy Dean brands and our Boscos and a number of other consumer-facing brands. How can we leverage this technology so that those brands, which are traditionally microwave prepared, don't get left by the wayside, right? We have a tastemaker's meal kit business that is struggling like every other meal kit business in the world is struggling for all the same reasons. Yes, even Tyson can't figure out that supply chain. So when we look at that and say, okay, well, here's a way for us to semi-prepare the meal and deliver it to folks, and it's great for me because I am useless in the kitchen uh, except for opening and closing doors. So can we, can we leverage this technology where we can inspire people to eat better and, and to eat more food? So can we get to a point where Tyson's on that platform and other food brands get on that platform too? Yeah, the, there's definitely a shift to look at how cooking technologies, not just the ingredients we give people or the way we package things, but the technologies themselves can make it easier, but also healthy and, and you know, more convenient and personalized. So um, I think that's really interesting. What is, uh, I'll go back to you, Brian, what is something that is, that worries you, some, the, a group that's going to get left behind from all this investment and, you know, is there, should we be worried about it, I guess, or is it just sort of the disruption that's naturally happening? What's, what's one of those areas? Uh, so, uh, yeah, we had a good conversation about this on the call with, with Tom, which was my big fear is that the people that make our food are getting left behind in this whole equation. Um, the average age of a farmer in America is 585 years old, they're either dying or retiring, and their kids don't want to take up their, 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 their task. Um, on top of that, you have labor issues within the farm industry. And these are the people that, you know, for pennies on the dollar, make our food. And that really worries me that the whole system is kind of leaving them behind, that we're starting at the um, uh, producer level and, and working up. And, and Tom can talk about a little bit about what Tyson's has kind of done to do that. But we also need to think that there is a, a origination of our food that has to be brought in this. And, and like, I'll, I'll give props to like Crow Cow and, and, and services that are connecting us to really good product in our farmers. We need more of that, not less. Um, now, that said, I do invest in things in the biotech realm that are, that are generating new foods starting in the lab. Uh, uh, side, but I think they're they're additive, not replaceative. I see that as we all need to eat more protein, and we just need to create more protein for the world in some way because a lot of the way that we create protein is inefficient today. Um, and so, how do we up level the farmers? But how do we also supply the needed ingredients for our food system in a more responsible way? Yeah, and just to build on that, I mean, Tyson has a network of 11,000 farmers that grow the food, grow the animals, grow the feed that goes into our supply chain. So if you think about what Brian's talking about, the aging out of the American farmer, what is that? what are the implications for that for Tyson, right? I mean, we'll do 35 million chickens per week. What happens when half of those farmers go away? And how do we fulfill the consumer demand, not only from a sustainability standpoint, but put on my business hat, Right, from a shareholder value, you know, return on value on their investment, how do I make sure that Tyson maintains that leading position as the number one protein provider in the U.S.? 25% of the protein consumed in this country, we make. So, and we st when you think about how, how many animals that is, and it's still only 25%, it gives you an idea of the scale of this industry, which I had no appreciation of before I started working for Tyson. Um, it, it's almost, it's imperative upon us to be making investments in these emerging techs, both on the producer side currently and on the emerging technology side. And, it, and, it, and it's weird to me to see like the dairy farmers fight alt milks. And when I go to the dairy farmers and I go, so couldn't you just plant almond trees on your farms with the cows care? And they're like, no. And I'm like, so why aren't you doing it? Like, you can make more money by having both the cows and the almonds, so why don't you get involved in this thing? And I think Tyson's a good example where you said, look, we're going to be in standard, you know, farm-raised, you know, chickens and, and, and proteins, but we're also going to get in Beyond Meat. And you said, like, we're about the protein, you know, and we have to manage this trillion-dollar market of traditional proteins, but we also have to be a player in the multi-billion-dollar markets of, of all proteins, right? Yeah, and it even got a lot more interesting when we did the cultured meat investments in Memphis Meats and Future Meat, and... Um, there were several blogs which used colorful language to describe both myself and Tom Hay as our CEO at the time. Um, and I've gone out to Dakota Dunes and met with the Fresh Meats folks, and, and they said, oh, you know, we took a few body blows on this. And, and sort of you come back to them and you say, yeah, but you guys raise cover crops as well, right? You're, you're grazing steer, you're raising hogs, but you also grow corn and you also grow soy on your farm. So 
I get what you're saying, but calm down a little bit. Like, we, we all diversify, you all do it too. You know, we have a large, like I said, we have a huge supply chain we need to, need to feed. Um, one thing that also came up that I thought was interesting was, you know, the innovation that's happening in ag tech around, and, and a lot of funding pouring into that space around, um, you know, making farming itself more efficient and, and not necessarily uh, looking at alternative means, but rather just making the processes that we've always known and gotten our food from efficient and, um, and you know, just, just helping them kind of scale and, and with those costs. And uh, Tom, you said something interesting on the call, which was, you know, we, we often look at the way that we, um, give farmers access to that technology. Small family farms, you know, the, the average farmer that's out there, they can't afford to, you know, be buying this huge infrastructure and, and investing in all kinds of new technologies. But you all sort of approach it as a, if we can, you know, help enable them, that gets us a little closer to, you know, that sustainability and diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our friends at, at ADM did this with Agrable from a precision ag standpoint. Mm -hmm. So ADM Ventures invested in Agrable. They actually became a, a client, a customer of the software. And then, get this, they gave it away for free to their farmers. And they said, this is a tool that we believe is yeah. going to make our supply chain more efficient, make your farms run better, and ultimately make you guys more money. And guess what? We're going to give it to you for free. Mm -hmm. I think it's an amazing sort of corporate shift from, you know, I'm going to invest in a piece yeah. of software and then force my network farmers to buy it because it'll grow the value of the company and make a lot of money. Yeah, that may happen, but you're going to get a much lower adoption rate, and those network farmers that you depend on are going to hate you for it. Yeah. Right. I mean, they deal enough with us coming in and saying, we want you to raise the animals thusly, and this is the feed you need to use. If we can, co if we can come at it from a different perspective and say, this is an enabling technology we think is going to change the industry, use it for free. See how it goes. Or you just give it to them for free. And as an investor, that's a key point because we're looking at how long are those sales cycles when you're selling into a customer. You know, if you can shorten that and then create like a, a sticky product where they're, you know, going to be a customer for a very, very long time, then that's important. So with small farmers, it's, it's difficult because they've done things for centuries or over generations and getting them to adopt a new process or a new way of doing things is, is pretty difficult. So we look at that and then we look at how fragmented is a market and a segment? You know, if it's deeply fragmented, then, you know, that's, that's going to take a long time as well. But I can't tell you how many, like, at least once every other week I get an email from somebody in the investor community that has a family that has a farm or a relative that has a farm, and they go, there's no resources for me to go find out what are the latest automated tractor equipment or sensor equipment or pathogen detection that I should be looking at. Like, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice, but I think we're trying to, at the early stages, trying to change that game, right? Is give some of these guys the opportunity to get into market and find all these small little cul-de-sacs. But there are organizations that should be helping us out with this. I mean, there are growers associations. There are people that can help us distribute this tech and then let the bigger guys finance the expansion like, like Tom, and, Tom and team. That's fine. <laughs> Um, that, that key point of access is really important, too, because we're talking about, um, you know, how food tech is going to, you know, transform the food system for 9 billion people, and access is a big problem in general. You talk about from, you know, Brian, you said this, which I thought was really interesting. We haven't figured out a way to scale CSAs yet, right? We haven't figured out a way to get local farming and that local, buy local movement in, in any kind of way that makes it, um, you know, sustainable past kind of that local community. Um, and the same is true of things like, you know, getting alternative um, proteins or, or any, any alternative products that would be easier to get to people who don't have access to, um, you know, or don't, aren't able to farm or uh, have fresh foods or whatnot. And so, you know, what is, is, is that a space that you all are looking for in, you know, invest interest there? What's, what's happening in that space and why is it so hard? Absolutely. And I think the big democratization happened with the internet. And so I go back to the biggest revolution in our, in our near-term history is um, the access of information and people to find things that they desire or demand and not have to go through middlemen or third parties to get them. Now, some can argue Amazon being the biggest third party in the world is going to play that role, but I think when we think about it, like if I'm a new food brand or I'm a new technology or I, I'm a, a new CSA, direct-to-consumer CSA solution, the internet allows me to, play a, to, to look like a bigger dog. Right? Um, what, what's that old is New York Times thing is like on the internet, no one knows you're a dog and stuff like that. And so I think we're getting to that stage where um, I can start a very small business and grow very, very fast by going around traditional uh, distribution means and direct to consumer. And that's the biggest revolution. 
Um, and I implore anybody that's in those middleman positions um, to start opening up data, to opening up resources to small companies to enable them to go through you because if they can't go through you, they'll go around you. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Um, I want to check real quick with the backstage folks if we have any questions up on the screen. We'll have them pop them up there. Um, but Carmen, going back to you for a second, um, you know, I'd love to for you to dig in a little bit more on the accelerator piece and how you how you choose folks for the accelerator once they're in. How do you help them make sure that there's the right product market fit and and make sure that before they move on to start going into manufacturing and production that they've got something there. Yeah, uh, on the hardware side. Uh, when we accept companies into the program, we ask a few questions. You know, what, what resources do you need to be successful? So this is both on the hard side in terms of equipment. Uh, you know, in our makerspace, we have $2 million worth of prototyping equipment. Uh, and then on the soft side, so, you know, um, this is either connections to different individuals or people with different types of experience in branding, marketing, and whatnot. Um, but the first month of our program is really focused on customer identification. In the hardware space, if you start spending money on manufacturing early on, you could be building um, the next Juicero. Uh, so you know, it's, it's very important for us to make sure that everyone in our accelerator program knows exactly who their customer is and what value they're adding. Yeah, that's important. So we have actually one great question up here, although I realize that, good Lord, I need glasses because I cannot see that on the conference monitor. Um, getting old. Uh, with hardware startups, kitchen hardware startups, there seems to be a focus on recurring revenue through subscriptions. Are subscriptions necessary for an investment? So I think that's interesting because that does seem to be definitely a trend in some places. No. <laughs> I, I think that subscriptions are a cool model that a lot of people pioneered with to try and see if we can get something reliably in someone's home or you know have them signed up. But I look back at the history of subscriptions and how we've, I don't know, I think we've aged off of subscriptions to be honest with you. I look at magazine subscriptions, gym subscriptions, all these things that we sign subscriptions for and they just constantly come into our inbox and TV and all these things. Um, I want more on demand. Mm. Like, I, like I think that's the thing predictive of what people want and then deliver them when they need that. And I, don't, I think that's the natural evolution of, of subscription businesses. But I also, like to go to Har uh, Carmen's point, hardware is a good business, sell hardware too. I mean, like you're building a physical good, you can make margin on it. I like to say Amazon's probably the only company that can amortize their hardware to zero, yet they don't. Like they still sell you a Kindle for 65, I think is the cheapest Kindle these days. Um, they're gonna take that money off the top for hardware. And, and, I, and I, I, I rue any hardware company that comes to me and goes, well, we're gonna make it all up on the back end with subscriptions. Like we're not gonna sell the hardware. I'm like, yeah. that makes no sense. We, are, we have a company that we invested in called Amped Innovation and they're providing um, services to, uh, distributing in 20 different countries in Africa and they're pr producing productive use appliances uh, and they're just spitting them out. So they're they're doing a maze grinder, an ice bucket, all that um, use renewable energy. So it is possible with talented folks to create hardware that you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I don't know if I'm just in a really benevolent mood or what, but I think if you want to build a really great subscription model, give the hardware away for free. Right? You're gonna you're gonna have a customer for life because. They look and say, this is a great idea and I can have this delivered to my home and it's ready to go, but I gotta pay what for this? So if you say, here's the, here's the device, use it. And you'll be able to amortize the cost of that over the life of that customer. But building, building true, that's the problem with meal kits, right? There's no brand loyalty, There's zero. So you know, people I'm gonna, say- I'm gonna challenge that. Unless you're a venture backed business that can go for <laughs> two or three years until you see the LTV and you know exactly what LTV you're gonna get from your customers, I think it's a really bad idea to give away the hardware. Um, and, and again, we buy hardware. I, I you're, you're, a thief, you're a thief anyway. It just, We're not it it just depends. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think, it, I think it, it definitely depends. Um, you know. <laughs> How many times are you gonna use that bag, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not it's a fair point. It's a, he has a fair point. And industry, industry 4.0 is all about taking insights and making them actionable. So, you know, it's hardware that's um, intelligent and actually providing consumers with value. Yeah. Yeah, and that on-demand piece, I think, is important. Like, don't just give me the ability to have something show up at my door. Give me the ability to, to pick what comes to the door and, and when it comes, right? So, um, all right, well, we are actually at time, but thank you so much to the panelists, and thank you all.